The first known occupiers of the lands where the spike stands were the Sisters of the Christian Retreat. In 1848, a group of seven sisters were to leave Les Fontenelles in France for London. As they left, they were told by Brother Jerome Magnum, Leave, dear sisters, carry with you the zeal for your rule. Plant the retreat in that house in London. Form the people that God will send you in the spirit of your vocation. On the 16th of December, 1848, they arrived at their new home, which they called Nazareth House, the base from which they were to help the poor people of Peckham. However, they were not there long, driven out by the noise and grime of the new Chatham and Dover Railway, but to this day, it seems they carried out their instruction. In 1850, the sisters left, and six years later it fell into the hands of the Camberwell Board of Guardians, who opened it as a poorhouse. In 1875, there were 110 aged and infirm men receiving board in exchange for labour on the site. The retreat was apparently a pleasant place to be, whilst compatible with the pockets of ratepayers. The gardens were actually running at a profit. However, as the Industrial Revolution took hold, two vast grey wings either side of the chapel were built, to provide a night's shelter to the ever-increasing numbers of homeless people in the area. The men now had to break up stone used for the local road expansion to earn their keep. Some say the name Spike originates from one of the metal tools the men would use to break the stone, though there are a few other suggestions. The old workhouses used to have two spikes in the yard. There'd be a spike at one end of the yard, a spike at the other end of the yard with a rope. And that's what people used to sleep on. They just used to lean on the rope and, and, and sleep. And, and that's where the expression spikes come from. By the 1930s, it had become a place that thousands of homeless men would end up in once in a while and get a wash, some food and a bed for the night. Camberwell was the godfather. It was probably, well it was, it was probably had more bed space at Camberwell than two thirds of all the other hostels put together. And wherever you talk to someone round parts of England, oh, the spike, everyone knows the spike. But it was a big old building. Yes, it was a big old building. Mm -hmm. Being without a place to be, some is just the way of being, you see. Things you just sort of change. Riddled lives, those with misfortune. Well, that day the, the gate day. opened about sort of four o'clock, uh, but they were queued right up the road for miles. All and if so, you know, someone had to come down the outside and try and push in. There was ructions, you know. Yeah. Was, you couldn't walk on the pavement this side of the road. There was all roads all over. Yeah. They would queue up, and um, that would probably take three to four hours to, to book them. So it was, uh, and you would probably have two or three of them taking their names. As I say, most of them you would know. Yeah, come on, John, move on, yeah, go and have a shower, go and see the lads upstairs, across there, go and have your shower. Name, so-and-so, so-and-so, yeah, move on. You see people, as you come past, they try and re recite poetry to you, and, and that was just sort of, you know, there wasn't many foreign people, uh, per se, but um, then there was others, that could be Jordan was sitting there with a great big bottle, uh, with, I mean, drinking, uh, which is something they shouldn't be drinking, like uh, methylated spirits or something, you know. They were all out, you know, drinking, they drink anything, right, like, you know, and they were really down on their luck. And, and uh, well, there was, some of them were actually in a terrible state, you know, they were a terrible state, you know, they, they were ill, I know a lot of them, but no one seemed to care. And uh, you never had any trouble, you never had the police down here, and I think. And he lost his wife and two children on a zebra crossing and he turned to drink. His life totally turned upside down for him, and he turned to drink. Now, when people turn around and say, well, that could never happen to me, it could do. You're probably only an inch away from your life going from being a decent working class person to an out and out. Everyone was welcome, because the simple reason is you didn't know who they were. I'd say from 60 to 70 in this in this big big dormitory room. Um, I don't think I slept off and on on the film, but you know, kept waking up and looking round on the film. 
was actually woke up by this one person at the bottom, this, this elderly man at the bottom. Um, he was going into some sort of frenzy. I watched my mate's back as well as well as I watched my back. And that's how it was. But that, because you never know who was booking in. Uh, the breakfast scene w w actually reminded me of the scene in Oliver, uh, where, where they're actually in the dining hall, and he goes up and asks for more. That, that's exactly just what it, what, what it looked like. If the men wanted to stay in the centre for the rest of the day, they'd be given chores to carry out. If the job wasn't done properly, well, you can't make me do it, then you don't get in this afternoon. It's as simple as that. We've got something you want, and then it has to work both ways. You want to come here for a meal and a bed for the night, in a way around it has to be paid for. So you have to sweep, mop up and do whatever. 90%, not a problem at all. You know, you've got to do a task. You might have to sweep the dining hall out or mop the bedroom out or something like that, you know. Uh, and then, you, you know, you back out on the road, uh, away down again. It's thought that George Orwell, under the tramping name P.S. Burton, stayed at the Peckham Spike whilst writing Down and Out in Paris and London. When he's actually writing, when he's actually writing about Down and Out in London, yeah. I, I don't know if it's the first one or the second one oh. that he visited, but it, you, can actually, you, you can actually tell yeah. that it's Gordon Road that he's talking about. And Fallery enjoyed it, did enjoy it. I'd been still there today. There was no way in the world would you have ever got me out of there. And when there was talk about it, really, it is going to shut down because it was government policy to close it. It did have to close. It was health and safety in there. Oh, you're talking about eight dormitories of 140 men in a dormitory. It was absolutely filthy in there. Written up in the Sunday Times in 1985, Deer notes that the paradox of the spike is that, for all its poor conditions, some people much prefer life in a big institution. Pools of urine in the dormitories are of less importance than the right to be left alone. 1985 saw the first Save the Spike campaign, when the council was considering bulldozing the lot. The local people tried to persuade the council to turn it into a mixture of flats, studios, workshops, community gardens and a theatre in the chapel. They desperately tried to raise funds, but the council sold off the majority of the site in 1990 to a housing association. A small portion, officially known as 39B Consort Road, was saved for the community, and during the 90s it was used by the children's scrap scheme. It'd be any scrap, any scrap we could use, you know, from foam to, mater to material to wood to cardboard, anything, yeah, yeah. Lots of art for the children, there'd be plays and things like that going on. That went on for about five years, and then again, because of money, um, it was closed down. Then the council abandoned the site, allowing it to get flytipped and vandalised. A group of local people worked hard to repair it and open up the site to those in need in the community. It is and was such a beautiful space, such a magical space. and. Um, I know myself and uh, lots of my friends were crying out for a space where we could come together and be creative and have events and practice our various crafts. The community project, known as the Spike Sepplis Scheme, provided a vast array of services and facilities, all available on a donations basis. So most things have been second-hand, they've been recycled, they've been donated. And the, the biggest donation we've had has been in terms of man-hours. People have just paid so much work into the place to bring it to this, into the condition that you see now. We're here 24-7. We're responsive to what's going on in our neighbourhood. And we just care so passionately about our future and the future of our kids and of the planet. And we believe that we have to make changes on a local level to affect the really grim picture that is beginning to develop for our future. It's such a, a pleasure to come here and so many people have come in and out throughout the day who are involved in other creative processes so it's a really it's a really amazing centre for creativity. Because it's, it's a very welcoming place and you can come here you can come here and be creative, or you can come here if you just need a little breather. And uh, you can always have a cup of tea, have a chat, 
There's some recording or just talk to people. It's cool. It's the only place I know like. contact with the spike was I was made bankrupt in 2007 um, and I was on the street in a caravan um, and I had basically nowhere to go um, and I didn't have any money so I couldn't afford to rent anywhere and the spike came forward and offered a space for all my equipment and all my belongings to be stored uh, and then later I was given a studio space and I was able to start working again and um, basically start to get back on my feet. If you give them the tools they'll be able to help themselves. Yeah. Um, and I totally believe in that. I can imagine that the, the, the men and the poor people that were there in the spike would have loved the freedom that has been offered by the new spike um, that was there um, in the last 10 years um, where we are able to fulfill our dreams and our skills and uh, be free. It's only by coming together and painting a positive vision of what is possible that can, we can really change things. It's only by empowering ourselves through working together collectively that we can really change things. I believe that communities need a physical focus. There are youth clubs and there are bowling clubs and there are age-specific community projects, but there's nothing really that brings everyone together. And the spike has always been about inclusion. After 10 years, the council decided to sell off the land and on the 16th of December 2008, they won a possession order forcing the Grassroots Community Centre to close. So I know that none of the good people here are ever going to give up. They're all good people that have operated in this place and I know that if it does get dissipated and they all get sent to the different parts of the four quarters of the world, every single one of them will start something similar where they land. And that can only be a good thing. As for the site, as the caretakers leave, we wait to see what comes next. How the wind blows Yeah, one road It seems it was all already Journey is yet to be seen